Professor Hassan Abbas, thank you so much for uh, having this interview with Afghanistan International. Thank you so much. Really honored. Sure. Thank you. Uh, let's start from uh, the point that you made in your book. So you explained that uh, Ashraf Ghani Ahmadzai, uh, uh, Afghan former president, uh, somehow uh, cleared the way for the Haqqani network uh, to take over Kabul because he really wanted to take revenge on uh, Zalmai Khalilzad. Uh, this is an interesting point. So explain that, please. Thank you so much. Um, this was first mentioned to me in passing by a very important cabinet minister of uh, Mr. Uh, President Ashraf Ghani, who told me this. And my first reaction was, how is that possible? And then I interviewed other people as well. The fact is that, of course, Taliban were at the gates of Kabul in any case. Um, Ash uh, Siraj Haqqani needed no support from Ashraf Ghani to, to win what he thought was his major battle. So they were already around uh, Kabul. But at the same time, Ashraf Ghani was convinced that there was this conspiracy between Zalmi Khalilzad, Ambassador Zalmi Khalilzad, between Mullah Baradar, and between President, former President Karzai. He was so much uh, convinced that these are three these of these people want, they are conspiring to get Ashraf Ghani out of Afghanistan. That was his thinking. And he has shared that with a couple of people in the US as well. And everyone said to him, no, this is not the case. When in the final days, even one month before um, the mm -hmm. fall of Kabul, um, Ashraf Ghani through his friends was asking different people in Washington DC, are Americans really leaving? And I talked to two of those people who Ashraf Ghani reached out to and they checked with the US government and they went back to Ashraf Ghani and said, look, US is really leaving Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And at that time he had last one month and he thought, still he was convinced it is Zalmi Khalilzad, Mullah Baradar and Karzai. So in the final days he realized that they want Mullah Baradar to be the new president or king of Afghanistan. And he said, OK, I'm, we say it in mm -hmm. um, Urdu and Farsi, uh, Urdu and we say, Ham to doobenge sanam tum ko bile doobenge, which means I'll go down, but I'll take you down as well. So he thought in the final days, he, somebody close to him on Ashraf Ghani's instigation gave a tip to Khalifa or Siraj Haqqani because to give an advantage to Siraj Haqqani so that he can come and grab some of the important positions. Because we knew that this was a battle between different Taliban groups also. Yeah, sure, sure. This is very, very important. So uh, please explain what exactly happened, which kind of information Ashraf Ghani shared with Saraj Din Haqqani, and when it happened. I think, to the best of my knowledge, this happened in the last 48 hours before August 15th, so mm -hmm. sometime between 13th and 14th. That is the time also when uh, uh, Amrullah Saleh, one of the very important leaders, um, I think of him as a very brave person mm -hmm. because there were so many suicide attacks. I, I respect him. Sure. Um, and Amrullah Saleh realized that Ashraf Ghani is not listening to him. And he, in the final days, he called actually a taxi, we know, that he wore black glasses that I heard from a person who was there, and he left. Only uh, Mohib was there, the, his close national security advisor, who also, also I know very well, and who, who has given lectures in my classes. And um, even if uh, he's not a friend, he's a very good acquaintance, and I respect him too. There was this final days of battle, and Ashraf, when Ashraf Ghani realized uh, that, and they had received a call from Khalil Haqqani one day before uh, the fall, and Khalil uh, Haqqani said to them, just get the hell out of, of Kabul. And they, there was a confusion in that regard as well, that they, this is the final warning and threat that is coming from the Haqqanis. Also, in the final days, Mohib was um, trying to convince Ashraf Ghani, let's leave. Mm -hmm. That's why Amrullah Saleh had left, because he wanted Ashraf Ghani to stand and fight. When Ashraf Ghani realized that all is lost, he said, OK, we, I don't want Mullah Baradar to be the big beneficiary. Give the tip to Haqqani. And he had links with Haqqanis because Haqqanis had helped him in winning the, two th the first election that Ashraf Ghani became president. And we know this from a former intelligence chief of uh, uh, Afghanistan, who I've given the footnote reference in detail, uh, that there was the Pakistani intelligence had helped uh, Ashraf Ghani through uh, Haqqani. So we, they, there was an old linkage between them as well. So which kind of information and tips, as you mentioned, uh, Ashraf Ghani shared with Sarajdin Haqqani? That he is leaving Afghanistan, that he's running away. 
uh, that he not running away is our word of course that he mm -hmm. said i am leaving if you want um, tomorrow th around that time come that's that's why i i deduct ashraf ghani ashraf ghani asks sirajuddin haqani to come tomorrow in an exact time mm, that i'm not sure uh, mm -hmm. about that specific details what i do know is that he gave this information through one of his associates to reach to to Hakani, Siraj Hakani, that if you, we are leaving and you can, uh, uh, you can come to Kabul, something to this effect. Again, so somehow just they deal, they reach the deal between Ashraf Ghani and Siraj Din Haqqani in terms of taking uh, over the capital of Afghanistan, Kabul, uh, by Siraj Din Haqqani's team. Again, I mean, the word deal would mean there is much more elements to it. There was some give and take. I'm not saying it is not possible. It is might be possible. My source only gave me this information, and that's why I'll stick to what I know, which is that Ghani ensured that the information that he's leaving is given to Siraj so that he's among the first ones who will come in, and he has the most advantage so that Mullah Brother is not getting the top position. He wanted to help uh, Siraj Haqqani against Mullah Brother. This much I know and this much I uh, got confirmed. That's why I mentioned the book. If there was any larger understanding or deal, I am not aware of it. So uh, we know that uh, Haqqani Network uh, took most powerful places in Kabul since uh, Ashraf Ghani left Afghanistan. So your explanation in the book indicates that that happened with the help of Ashraf Ghani, because Ashraf Ghani really hated Zalmai Khalilzad and Mullah Baradar. That's true. That's what con conclusion I've reached. Um, that that's it was against Mullah Mar, uh, Sorry, uh, it was against Mullah Baradar and Zalmai Khalilzad plan. Ashraf Ghani had an old history with Zalmai Khalilzad. They were friends also, but they hated each other as well. Mm -hmm. And they both thought that the other is the biggest obstacle to peace deal. Zalmai Khalilzad thought. Zalmi Khalilzad, if you talk to him, tells everyone that things could have been much more smoother. And Mullah, if Mullah Baradar was the head of Taliban today or as prime minister mm -hmm. or president, um, things would have gone according to the Doha peace plan. And he blames it on Ashraf Ghani's sudden escape and departure that the whole plan collapsed. And uh, that's probably Mullah Baradar also thinks so. Because Mullah Baradar became, Mullah Baradar knew that he, the Pakistani, establishment intelligence and military was against Mullah Baradar because they never liked him. Uh, they never wanted him to be a leader. They liked uh, Haqqani much more. Mm -hmm. So it suited Pakistan. It suited uh, Haqqani as well. And it was an opportunity for uh, Ashraf Ghani to really take revenge from Zalmi Khalilzad also through pushing aside Mullah Baradar. That's the kind of uh, game that was played out. Um, that again was shared with me by a very close cabinet member, a very important person, uh, close to Ashraf Ghani, who did most of the people who were close to Ashraf Ghani really blame everything on Ashraf Ghani, why he left at the final moment, mm -hmm. despite saying to everyone, I'll stand by and I'll so, fight. Yeah. So before we get to the rivalry that is going on between uh, different parts of, of Taliban, as you mentioned in your book, The Return of the Taliban. So let me ask you this uh, question, uh, Professor Abbas. So how reliable this information is? I know you're a professor at, uh, yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, uh, at Defense University here in Washington, D.C. So how reliable this information is, uh, would you uh, defend your source, your information that is reliable? I think so. Again, uh, this is a good question, and I, I, I appreciate the critical element of it. Um, the way the academic books um, and professors operate differently than journalists, and nothing to take away from journalists. Journalists have a different role. As a professor academic, I have a different role. Um, the book with an academic press goes through pre-review. First, when you do the proposal. Once, secondly, when you uh, publish it, the final manuscript. Uh, then, as an academic, I have to defend. I have a reputation to defend. I have previous books as well. So, it, on this point, actually, this is one point out of the three points where I really had to think hard. Mm -hmm. Do I put it in the book or I don't put it in the book? And um, although I wanted to a sto story, the academic books, we don't become rich by these books. I mean, academic, out, it's a $25 book, I'll get $1 maximum from one book. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it, that is never the inst factor. But this made sense. 
when I looked at all the rivalries, mm -hmm. other than the source, the first source tells you, then you use your common sense, does it make sense? And the more and more I came to know about the rivalry between Ashraf Hani and Zalme Khalilzad, how since their college days, they were again always competing with each other. There's an outstanding story in New York Times by Mujib Mishal. Uh, Mujib has done an amazing story on the background. I borrowed a lot from there. Sure. Then I interviewed many people. So I am quite confident. Um, again, you because I talked to then one other person, I said, uh -huh. this is what Mr. So-and-so, who is a very important cabinet minister, who is also has good relations with Pakistan, who remained in a very critical ministry. He knew it and he's an old guy. I mean, at this time when I met him face to face, sure, sure. there's no reason he would lie. I asked somebody else who said, yes, we have heard this as well. They actually, somebody recently told me this was in some news as well. And then I used my common sense. And still as an academic, I would say, um, if it if I came to know ever this is totally wrong, I will accept the mistake. It, if, it, if it is a mistake, I'll say it is an honest mistake. So, but you're but sure that I you're pretty confident. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, for me, it was too big of a risk mm -hmm. to say something which I cannot prove. And again, as I qualified, I have no further information on who conveyed the information, right. uh, whether this was a, led to a deal or not. Uh, uh, that I don't know. Mm -hmm. So the, the communication, sharing intelligence information uh, between Siraj Din Haqqani and Ashraf Ghani uh, was only between them or Ashraf Ghani and his team reached out to Pakistani as well? I would assume this reached out to Pakistan as well. Uh, again, no information on this part, but uh, it seems to me because Pakistan was helping Haqqani, there's no doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, among all the top players, and that's important to know today because in the West we often think of Taliban as one group. No, the way uh, Mullah Hibbatullah, people call him Amir al-Mu'mineen, I'm sorry I don't think that is that is a title used for some most important Islamic personalities, sure. I, but because that's a title he uses, his Chief Justice um, Abdul Hakim Isaac Zai or Haqqani, um, they are very bigoted, they have a very different radical extremist understanding of Islam. They're, they're one group, Kandharis. Mm -hmm. the, those uh, Mullah Yaqub uh, with the old friends of Mullah Omar and others, I would say a separate group. Haqqanis have a whole different network and, ex and infrastructure. They have their own support base. Then there are many others. Mm -hmm. I know that there are huge rivalries in between all of them. Pakistan always was on side with Haqqanis. Like Pakistan and uh, Gulbuddin Hikmatya, they loved him. Yeah, sure. So let's stick with this rivalry between Mullah Baradar and also Haqqani. Uh, Mullah Baradar, as you mentioned in your book, uh, is close to Kandaharis, right? Okay. So, and, and, and there is uh, Mullah Yaqub and also Sirajuddin Haqqani that they have differences, uh, but still work together. And they are close to Pakistanis. So explain this rivalry. How deep is it? How uh, 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 serious is it? And what exactly they are fighting for in a different way. Thank you so much. They're all fighting for power. Mm -hmm. It is uh, in many ways, it is it is the greed for power and it is it is the uh, the greed for total control. Uh, Siraj Haqqani and Mullah uh, Yaqub, although they work together in many cases, mm -hmm. they uh, two people told me and I when I was talking to those in among the Taliban, they both have spies in each other's ministries. One person told me that the current presidential palace where they all ministries are very much like the time of Ashraf Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah when they both thought that each one is spying on the other. If you move from one uh, kind of building to the other within the presidential palace, especially between the defense ministry and interior ministry, um, they, they are checked. They are checked whether somebody is taking a document under their clothes or something else. Both have spies in each other's as well. They eat together, they work together, they have some common agenda against Kandahar, common mm -hmm. agenda, uh, not necessarily against, but a competing agenda. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, Mullah Yaqub thinks being son of Mullah Omar, he should be the next uh, top leader. leader. Mm -hmm. Haqqani thinks he's the pragmatic man who can lead. So they have the internal rivalry as well. And uh, so that is one level of rivalry. Sir, the Hibbatullah worldview, this is the old classic Taliban who are De Sunni, Deobandi, Hanafi, but they have gone to an interpretation of Deobandi Islam, which is very extreme. Um, the, the book from uh, Abdul Hakim Ishaq Zai that I had a chance to read um, was saying 
yes, even if there's a democracy of sorts, he's not that he's recommending that yeah. for Afghanistan, women cannot vote. Women have to stay inside. Unless mm. they're dying, they cannot go out. Very extreme version, which the Pakistani and Indian Deobandis will not even accept. So there are some rivalries on theological level. Mm -hmm. There are some on political level. But it, ultimately, it is a game for power. Yeah, and, and, and they are currently, the Kandaharis are holding the real power. And there is no one on the other side to challenge them, right? Yes, but Ministry of Interior has many security forces, mm -hmm. defense ministry, although in both ministries, the Kandaharis have appointed the deputy ministers as their guys. So there is a check on Siraj, there is a mm -hmm. check on Yaqub. However, Mullah Habitullah is becoming insecure because he's building his, now his own security force, mm -hmm. hiring all the people from Nur Zai from his sub-tribe. Mm -hmm. One person told me that Iranians gave him, Iranians sent a delegation to Habitullah and said to him, build something like IRCG because you need your own presidential security force. And uh, he actually hired, someone told me, a former Soviet-era trained Afghan colonels also, Hibatullah, in his team. He made in charge one of those people. In his so he, the reason he's building his own army, small mm -hmm. army, mm -hmm. because he's probably not trusting uh, Yaqub and Siraj beyond a certain point. Sure, sure. Let's get to... Uh, mm. Uh, to Pakistanis and the Taliban, Afghan Taliban. So you mentioned in your book that uh, somehow it's still it's Raul Pindi that controls uh, Afghan Taliban. Uh, even like in 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 uh, all uh, decision making level, it's just all what Pakistanis say, not uh, Afghan Taliban. Pakistani military and intelligence has a huge influence on Taliban. There's no doubt about it. I'll give you an anecdote. Mm -hmm. um, uh, remember, Mullah Yaqub had given a very strong statement against Pakistan. Mm -hmm. There were some border skirmishes, and he gave some strong statement against Pakistan. I happened to meet a senior Pakistani military official that day, and I asked him, Mullah Yaqub is giving such terrible statements about you guys, mm -hmm. and you are his friends. He smiled and he said, well, Mullah Yaqub's family lives in Karachi, and he needs our chartered plane that we send him to meet his family. So these statements come and go, but he's dependent on us. So Pakistan army, not on all of them. I think Mullah Hibatullah, uh, for instance, is not giving them as much time as the Pakistani military would want. Mm -hmm. In one case, he refused to meet the Pakistani intelligence chief, I learned. This is not in the book, but I learned about it later on. Uh, even some of the Pakistani top foreign office diplomats uh, who were involved in the most important conversations, Pakistani ambassador, Hibatullah said, I'm not going to meet them. I mm -hmm. don't have time for them. So, Ibadullah is slightly in a, acting in a different way. Other Taliban had told Pakistan after August 15, look, most Afghans have a very critical position about Pakistan. People hate Pakistan also because they think of your sure. involvement. Don't seem to be too close to us. But the reality is, it's not total control because some of the Taliban leaders have excellent relationship with Doha, with Qatar, with UAE, with Turkey. Pakistan is one player, very important player. But to, I don't, would not say that Pakistan has the most dominant or exclusive control on Taliban. There are now other players as well who are very important and all those who are against Haqqani, they don't want to talk to Pakistan because they think Pakistanis are favoring Haqqani sure. over others. So give me some examples that Pakistanis had a deep role in terms of uh, decision makings uh, in Kabul under Taliban's role. Give me some examples. There are two stories that come to my mind mm -hmm. uh, immediately. There are others as well. One is, um, of course, when uh, the most critical state decision came that uh, Taliban should allow India mm -hmm. to have an embassy. Embassy is an official legal word, so an office there, yeah. but which is practically an embassy. And um, Taliban knew that even if they have their friendship with Pakistan, but they have issues with them as well. The border skirmishes, TTP issue, which we can talk later on, have big issues. So. But they knew that this is something Pakistanis are not going to accept. Mm -hmm. So Muttaki went to uh, 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 talk to Pakistanis who said only General Bajwa, who's the army chief, can make the decision. They took it to him and he made a case that, look, Indians, we need to talk to India. And he said, yes, we are also on the same line. Please go ahead and allow Indians to come back. This was a major decision. And Muttaki, this was a, Muttaki was coming in a special plane to GHQ Pindi many times. There was another issue as well. There was a cabinet minister who 
uh, was very important Afghan Taliban leader, very close to Mullah Umar, uh, uh, Badr who is later now finance minister. Mm -hmm. Pakistani intelligence had beaten him so much in 2001, they threw him in a place thinking he's dead man. God has, uh, God, it is in God's control who lives and dies. He was successful, he survived. Mm -hmm. He went back. Pakistanis wanted to hand him over to US to, for Guantanamo Bay. He survived, he's changed his name. Now, then with the change name, he was finance minister. Pakistanis realized, oh, this is that guy. We thought he's dead. Yeah. So also for that, the permission came from Bajwa. Not on all things, but I know that out of 33 cabinet members, 13 members are, for example, graduates from Madrasa Haqqaniyan. Mm. And I went to Madrasa Haqqaniyan and other people, uh, not went there per se, but in Islamabad, some meetings took place. I, uh, it is they who gave me the list of those members uh, who were graduates of uh, Madrasa Haqqaniyan, who are now in cabinet in, uh, cabinet in Afghanistan. Who gave the go-ahead? Those were all pa Pakistani intelligence so, had links. Yeah. So uh, explain about these individuals. Who are they? Where their families uh, are living in Pakistan? And how uh, dependent are they on Pakistan? Look, some of them, their families are in Peshawar. Um, some of their families are in Quetta. For example? Um, I will not name because of the security issues. I Again, I cannot claim I know all of them, mm -hmm. uh, their families. But this I was told firsthand, like Mullah Yaqub I shared, his family is in Karachi. Um, there are others in Quetta as well and in Peshawar as well. However, we must acknowledge the, the Afghan Taliban are not necessarily very happy with this. They, they is this always in the political science terms, in the intelligence field, we say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, this tension between the, the, the client uh, and the handler. Mm -hmm. So they, Afghan Taliban are not necessarily very happy because some of their folks like Mullah Brother, mm -hmm. they lost Mullah Brother because they were so, I mean, uh, violent with Mullah Brother. They kept him in custody. Uh -huh. they, Mullah Brother was very important. So some of the people who, even whom they control, they have developed rivalries. There are others who still they have control on. I think it is safe to bet that all their two members uh, who are actually masters and PhDs from Islamic University in Islamabad, uh, Islamic University in Islamabad, they are also cabinet members. There is a tension and tussle going on. Those who have a good relationship with Pakistan, who they can influence, uh, and there are others who have become enemies of Pakistan also because of their rivalries, because they believe they were mishandled also. Mm -hmm. And also you mentioned in your book that, you know, the current cabinet of the Taliban is basically what uh, General Faiz Hamid shaped it. Um, not if the all of it, they were not giving enough positions. That's why he had to go there. Mm -hmm. And it became a big issue because he, when he landed there, later on, it the was picture a, came out. picture came out and in the parliament he was questioned in a secret uh, closed door event. Why were you pictured there? He said mm. the American intelligence chief and the Chinese intelligence chief were also were there. there. Okay. He said, but you were pictured. Mm -hmm. So he most, we don't know what, but he certainly pushed for inclusion of some members. Most likely what I heard um, is some of the members of the Haqqani clan who were given positions. Sure. It was Faiz Hamid who pushed for that. Okay. So you mentioned also in your book that, you know, Pakistan's uh, officials have talked and helped uh, Taliban's enemies as well, some uh, warlords from other, uh, you know, ethnicities. So explain that. Who uh, meet with whom and what they were asking for? Pakistan had learned from the 2001 situation mm -hmm. that you cannot put all your eggs in the same basket because they are concerned that, yes, Afghan Taliban, we have either friendships or we can blackmail some and we can manipulate others. But what about all those others who are outside? So we don't want them from a Pakistani view, viewpoint. They never wanted to hand them over to India. Mm -hmm. So they said, this time we will give the favors. If uh, Mr. Noor is going to uh, Turkey, we'll provide the flight. They, uh, one person told me uh, from the Pakistani intelligence, they said, except Amrullah Saleh, we are in touch with everyone. We have taken their families out. We have moved some to Islamabad. They are doing favors for the long-term position, one, to put pressure on Taliban. If they think of not obeying or not listening to us, we can tell them always, okay, we are friends with the other side also. And at the same time, Pakistan don't want to give that opportunity to India again mm -hmm. to develop their old Northern Alliance folks 
that they will take them to India and all that. They said, no, we will not give, we will not commit the old mistake mm -hmm. and keep relationship there. So well. which kind of connection uh, is uh, going on uh, and has been built between the uh, Northern Alliance members and Pakistanis? I think it was initially helping them. For instance, they were mostly transiting through Pakistan to go to Turkey, UAE, Qatar. And we can't forget, Turkey, Qatar and UAE also are big players. Iran also is a big player. Pakistan mm -hmm. is not very happy about it. Mm -hmm. In fact, in one case, Pakistan said to the Americans, we know that you are talking to, depending on Qatar for all the negotiations, please do be, be sure we are important player than Qatar. So there are those rivalries as well. Pakistan most likely have lost some people also to more influence from Qatar and UAE because they are also big players now. Yeah, sure. But uh, my question is about the, uh, so you mentioned that Khalid Noor, the son of uh, uh, Atta Muhammad Noor and seven uh, members of uh, uh, non-Pashtun politicians uh, met with uh, Imran Khan and also the chief army uh, General that is, Bajwa. That is true. Who, and they, what they wanted, who were they uh, and, and what Pakistani told them? Very good question and I'm glad you, it means you read my book closely so I'm happy. They, that was the, right the moment of 13th, 14th and 15th of uh, August when mm -hmm. all the Northern Alliance, of those uh, uh, Karzai folks realized they were unhappy with Karzai. Some of them were unhappy for a long time. They realized that they, now the Pakistanis have kind of won because their friends and their uh, closest allies, Taliban, are in mm -hmm. power and they have interests in Afghanistan. They said it is better for us to work with Pakistan now because they are in more control. So they came, one, for some reconciliation. Secondly, they wanted an inclusive government. Thirdly, they wanted to tell Pakistan, okay, we are not your enemies. Don't keep us out because they have interests. They are their financial assets. There are other friends. They are family members in that area. So there was the, that dialogue. It, Pakistan had also tried to expand their network. But they met Imran Khan, they met the army chief, and they wanted that uh, Taliban should not be given a total clean slate, and there should be some kind of inclusive government. That's why those meetings had happened. Who were those person? Well, two, two, two figures, seven these, person. Uh, I don't remember offhand, but those were actually uh, published in Pakistani newspapers at that time. This was a delegation, official delegation, mm -hmm. which had gone from Kabul, and they were some people, one of them I talked to, they said, oh, we had no idea that Kabul will fall tomorrow. I told them. Yeah. Everyone How about see. now? So do you think, Professor Abbas, that Pakistanis uh, in a high level uh, are in touch with the Northern Alliance members who are living in Turkey and some, some of them in um, uh, Europe, mostly in Turkey and Iran? So uh, are they in touch? I am sure they are not necessarily with Iran because Iran mm. has its own interests. Mm -hmm. um, UAE and Doha, they are also very exclusive in who they want to meet and not. And in fact, the more independent ones are in Doha. But I was told, and this again, I have no way to verify. Mm -hmm. My interviews in Pakistan told me they are in touch with all them. They in fact said that the prices in Islamabad uh, market, the price of land has gone up. So many Afghans have come. Mm -hmm. To settle there, they can't buy a place or get a house unless supported by Pakistani intelligence. So many of the senior officials from the Ghani government are now in Islamabad because Islamabad wants to, because they have such deep interest in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Pakistan thinks of Afghanistan as its backyard. Yeah, sure. They want to control it. Mm -hmm. So they want, they know, this time we will build relationship with everyone. All the international community is asking Taliban to, uh, you know, give, uh, 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 you know, open the universities, the schools, and so on and so forth. Recognize human rights, women's rights, and so forth and so forth. Taliban are saying no. Well, this is our policy. So, what do you think? What do you think? Uh, will Taliban uh, allow women uh, to go back to school and uh, work with the, you know, like with Afghan people? Uh, and accept their, their, their requests and their demands or not? I think so long as Mullah Hebatullah mm -hmm. is the king and uh, Abdul Hakim is his chief advisor, uh, this is not going to happen, uh, unfortunately. However, there's a rising pressure from the Kabul cabinet. Even the prime minister, who's from the old guard, they are trying to tell Hebatullah that what you are doing is going to further isolate us. So they, this debate is becoming severe. There are three to four districts which defied and they were, girls were going to school even when there was a ban. 
So even Haqqanis have once threatened, this is not in the book, but I came to know of this from a very credible source. Haqqani said, look, in my area of control, I'm going to open schools. And he was told, if you are going to do that, you can do it independently and we have to fight before that happens. So there is a huge challenge. My view is that um, from, from the outside world, unless there is a coordinated policy, you will not be able to influence Taliban. US is saying one thing, Russia is saying third thing, China is helping the other way, region Uzbekistan is giving free electricity, Tajikistan is giving access to internet, Pakistan is giving money from the border check posts. India is build, training officials from Taliban now. India is doing mm -hmm. their tax and security guys. So long as each country is pushing their own interest and they are not concerned about the ordinary human beings in Afghanistan, things will not improve. And that is the biggest tragedy. No one, and I am genuinely telling you this out of my um, uh, core concern, what really is happening to the Afghan people the region, the global world as well, they give a damn about it. Okay. So they don't what, care, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Yeah. And, and then what, what will happen then? What would, uh, I mean, the future look like? The future look like either those Afghan Taliban and those young elements mm -hmm. who are different than the old Taliban. It is, it is, it is, I, uh, my argument is many elements among the young, they have the phone in their hands, they are, they have exposure to the world. They, previously, all they had seen was Kandahar, Peshawar, Koita. Now they have seen Dubai, they have seen Qatar, they have seen the world. There are many people who don't want to remain isolated. The Deobandi elements, some of them are also telling mm -hmm. them, you mm -hmm. don't want to give a negative picture. So there are pressures. If there is an internal pressure, it may push Taliban. Outside pressure, I doubt will have an impact. It will have to be a regional coordinated step-by-step -step engagement, mm -hmm. which will have some Pakistan, UAE, if today I bet, in my last sentence, if Turkey, UAE, Qatar, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, China, they all have their foreign ministers go to Mullah Habatullah and tell him, if girls are not going to school, we are closing our offices, your airport will be closed, we are not going to do trade with you, his mind will be in the right place. And he will have to, you will have to pressurize him but in from the regional players. At this moment, every country is playing their own game. If that continues to happen, I'm sorry, I see more trouble in Afghanistan, more violence in Afghanistan, terrible situation for the Afghan people, and it will be a matter of time that some extremist militant terrorist organizations will find space in that. That's why it is an urgent moment. That's why I wrote this book. Thank you so very much, Professor Hassan Abbas. I appreciate it. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much.